on this very special episode, we'll be exploring one of the most monumental exhibits in recent history. In 2019, the zoo completed this two-phase, $22 million project, sparing no expense, a award-winning, immersive journey that gradually ascends from the grassland foothills of northern India to the boreal forests of China, concluding with the Himalayan mountains, by far one of the zoo's most progressive updates in recent years. So without any further to do, welcome to the Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo's Asian Highlands. Settled near the Simons Aviary is where this journey begins. The entrance was built to resemble Himalayan ruins, but the first exhibit is actually outside of this in what depicts a abandoned hillside taken over by nature. This good sized space includes many climbing opportunities for the red panda. Red pandas are arboreal, meaning that they live in and spend the majority of their time in trees. With this, they also have incredibly flexible ankles, which make them skilled climbers. Their fibula can rotate around its axis, making it possible for them to climb down a tree head first. Although Sabal here isn't alone, he shares this space with multiple reefs muntjac. These small deer are also known as Chinese muntjac or barking deer due to their unusual, distinctive barking sound. Unlike females, males have short antlers and long canines that can be used when fighting to wound the opponent. From here, across from this, is another smaller yard, home to a pair of white naped cranes. These birds can grow around four feet tall, and during mating season, these pairs will participate in what's known as Yuzhen calling, a set of coordinated calls. Females produce two calls for every one a male makes. Pairs will also participate in a form of dancing, including running, jumping, wing flapping, and or throwing objects in their environment. Dancing is said to relieve tension between the birds, thus strengthening their bond. Back to the right side of the path, the theme of the Asian grasslands continues to another yard showcasing the tufted deer. They get their name from their characteristic tuft of blackish brown hair on their head, despite being closely related to the muntjac, they have longer legs and overall tend to be larger in size. Although similarly, males have fang-like canines that can grow up to one inch in length. Due to having very short antlers, these canines play a prominent role in fighting and other forms of conflict. So ahead, our ascent continues into phase two, and further down is a sign which warns about how the sinking ground ahead may be unsuitable for travelers, urging you to stay on the path. Here you can already see the devastation with a sunken village water well. The journey continues under a old rusted steel bridge where the zoo train can pass above. The path proceeds along the river until finally reaching a habitat for the sloth bear. 
This exhibit is littered with village remains and can be viewed from here along with a demonstration area as well as further down at multiple glass panels. In the 1700s, sloth bears were actually believed to be a type of sloth, which is most likely because of their shaggy coats and curved claws. However, they aren't related to sloths at all. Although unlike other species of bear, mothers will carry their young on their backs. Their ability to close their nostrils completely along with these very thick coats protect them when raiding beehives or termite nests. They'll tear open the nest with their claws and because adults lack their upper incisors, they can freely suck up insects with ease. After crossing a colorful wooden bridge, the trail takes you to the foggy forest, a 8,200 square foot area for children to explore while searching for six different lifelike animal sculptures amongst boulders, bushes, and logs. This foggy forest was built to represent a blanket of mist and fog covering the forest floor, and with this, this is one of the zoo's more interactive areas for kids. Our journey continues as we approach the summit of this voyage. We have now entered the Boreal Forest Range. There's a plaza-like area, including a replica of a stupa, a Buddhist structure. Welcome to the Tiger Falls. This 13,000 square foot habitat is not only viewable from the glass, but through mesh at the Tiger Training Area, which is surrounded by amphitheater-styled seating that can seat up to 100 visitors. Coincidentally enough, this is also the location for their Keeper Talks, where you can get an up-close view at a Tiger to Keeper Training Session. Their new space is littered with rocks, dense vegetation, multiple cascading waterfalls, and a 440 foot stream flowing throughout the exhibit. Amar or Siberian tigers get their name from the Amar River that spans throughout eastern Russia, along with being the most common in captivity they are also the largest species of tiger. Because of their size, they can conserve more heat in these harsh environments. With this, they also have a layer of fat, dense thick fur, and additional fur on their paws that protect them from colder climates, much like Omaha winters. Ascending once more, we reach the highest point in the Asian highlands at 35 feet in total elevation from the entrance. First up is a roughly 3,000 square foot space simulating the rugged Himalayan mountain cliff face, including remains of a old hillside village. Not only can it be viewed from here, but down the full length of the exhibit. This space is home to the zoo's snow leopards, and if you're lucky, early in the morning, you might be able to catch a glimpse of a training demonstration. These medium-sized cats have a long, thick spotted fur that covers the entirety of their body except for their noses, including their four and a half foot long tails, which help them when scaling rocky terrain. Other than for warmth, 
this fur can also be used as camouflage that helps them when hunting the hoofstock, rodents, and the birds that they eat since they are considered vulnerable in the wild and due to their incredibly elusive nature, they are rarely seen or studied outside of captivity. Although the zoo has been helping out with their numbers, as last I checked, 37 snow leopards have been born here in Omaha, coming from 20 litters, most recently in 2019. Adjacent to this is a nearly 18,000 square foot hillside, including rocky slopes, cliff faces, and a stream, all of which depicting the Himalayan Alpine. In here, you'll find a herd of Sichuan Tonkin, despite resembling some type of goat antelope hybrid, they are actually more closely related to sheep. Regardless of being large animals, males averaging 660 to 770 pounds, they are actually quite agile. Although because of this, they have few natural predators. They are herbivores who feed on various types of plants, shrubs, as well as bamboo shoots and bark. Both males and females have horns that naturally curve upwards that can be used for defense or headbutting. The Tokens share this space with the Long-Tailed Garau, another parkour champion adapted to the mountainous terrain of Northern and Eastern Asia. In the wild, these smaller goat antelope feed on grass, wood, and fruit when available. They get their name from their long, darkish brown bushy tails. This species in the wild will oftentimes live in small herds of 2 to 12 individuals consisting of females and their offspring. But males tend to be solitary. And although I wasn't able to find out how many places exhibit them, it does appear that they are quite rare in the US. Before moving on, it would be good to note that intercepting the previous exhibit is the Yeti Camp, a smaller rest stop area themed after the Mount Everest camp in Nepal, complete with bathrooms, seating, concessions, a small gift shop, and many prayer flags. Tibetan prayer flags are used in some cultures to symbolize peace, wisdom, and strength. So we continue, once more descending into the grasslands of India, although technically now we're back in phase one. First up, a smaller, 3,200 square foot holding yard, but this isn't all they have. They also have access to an additional 21,500 square foot yard, making it the largest in the Asian highlands. The Indian or greater one-horned rhinoceros is the largest species of rhino found in Asia. Other than their distinctive single horn, they also have folded skin, giving off that armor-like appearance. Months after this exhibit opened, in August of 2019, the zoo welcomed Marshall, the first Indian rhinoceros born in the zoo's 120-year history. Born to first-time mother, Hilary, and male John II, at birth, he weighed about 120 pounds. Now he's about two years old, and he's still got a good ways to go until he reaches his parents' weight of about 4,200 pounds. Normally, calves tend to stay with their mothers until they are about two to three years old, but technically, they are usually fully weaned 
At 18 months, once leaving their mothers, young rhinos will live a solitary life outside of breeding season. But the rhinos aren't alone. With them are the critically endangered Pier David's deer. In 1939, the last of this species was declared extinct due to habitat loss and poaching. Around this time, several specimens still existed in English zoos. It wasn't until 1986 that a small population was reintroduced into China. To this day, roughly 700 of these endangered animals live in the wild, although captive breeding efforts across many facilities are helping their numbers grow in hopes that someday they may be able to be reintroduced into their native range once more. So that pretty much closes out our first tour of one of the world's greatest zoos, a $22 million well spent to create a award-winning journey like no other, oftentimes known as one of the most ambitious projects in the zoo's history. Through our time covering the Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo, we'll just have to see if that's true. So until next time, thank you for watching.